John Sawada often would begin his Dharma talk with a reminder that we should approach the practice with an attitude of respect and an attitude of confidence. Now the respect and the confidence go both ways. In other words, respect for the path itself and also respect for ourselves. Confidence in the path, confidence in ourselves. Because after all, what's the basic message of the Buddha's teachings? It's that it's through human effort that we can achieve total happiness and unconditioned happiness. In other words, our efforts can go that far. And so we should have respect for that potential within ourselves. But at the same time, we should have respect for the experience of people who've been on the path before us, because they can show us a lot and help us save a lot of time and a lot of grief, help keep us on the path. And then there's respect for the principle of cause and effect itself, because that's what the Buddha awakened to essentially on the night of his awakening the role that human action plays in shaping our experience. And it's not an arbitrary role. It may be complex, but it does follow certain rules. And we should have respect for that principle as well. The principle of karma means that sometimes our actions bear immediate results, sometimes, sometimes it takes time. And so in respect of that, we have to bring not only an attitude of respect and confidence to the practice, but also one of patience. We're here to learn, and it may take time to learn. So when things aren't going well, remind yourself that this is a process that takes time. So you don't browbeat yourself and get down on yourself. Simply that you be more realistic about what what we're undertaking here, which is the total training of the mind, learning new habits and how we relate to the body, how we relate to our feelings, how we relate to our perceptions, our thought constructs, even how we relate to consciousness. The Buddha points out that we tend to relate to these things in unskillful ways, and we've got to learn new skills. So that instead of making a burden out of these things, we actually turn them into the path to true happiness. And that's going to take time, because some of these things are very subtle. You know, what is your relationship to feeling, say? What is your relationship to con consciousness? These are subtle things. It takes time to work through them. So before you settle down to the meditation, try to develop an attitude of patience, an attitude of respect, an attitude of confidence. We often think of these things as the end products of the meditation, but we should have our own skills already, just from ordinary daily life. How do you build up an attitude of confidence? How do you build up an attitude of respect? How do you build up an attitude of patience? You've been doing it all along to a greater or lesser extent. Try to bring those skills to bear on this practice, because it is a practice that requires precision. It's not something you can rush into or bluff your way through. It takes time and patience to develop the kind of detailed skills, the detailed sensitivities that are really required. So when you're clear about that fact, it makes it a lot easier to overcome obstacles in the path. We're here to learn a skill, and skills often require trial and error, learning from mistakes. I had a friend who's a potter, and she went to Japan to study pottery with one of the na living national treasures they have over there. And she always found it frustrating in the beginning as she studied with them, and she'd send her pots into the kiln, and the next day they'd come out, most of them were broken. Or unevenly burned, whereas his pots seemed to come out perfectly every time, every time. 
until one morning she came in and he was sitting in the middle of the kiln. Turned out that night's pots, the burn, or the pots that they fired that night, many of them had exploded in the kiln. But he wasn't upset. He was sitting there trying to figure out why. And that's what makes the difference between a person who really did, does develop a skill and a person who can't quite make it. In other words, the ability not to get upset by your mistakes, but simply to look at them and take them as learning experiences. If you have that much respect for yourself, that much respect for the principle of cause and effect, then you find it easier and easier to be patient. In other words, you don't take it as a reflection on yourself that you made a mistake. Because everybody makes mistakes. You look at the, the Buddha's life up until the night of his awakening. Was, many times it was one mistake after another. Trying different methods that just didn't work out, didn't work out. Listening to other people, trying what they had to, what they had to offer. When that didn't satisfy him, he went off into the forest to make his own mistakes. And it was only after many years of mistakes that he finally got on the right path. What saw him through was that sense of confidence. There must be a way to true happiness. And that was, if that existed, he was going to find it. Patience. Confidence, respect, these things all go together. So try to develop them as an attitude that you bring to the practice every time, every time, every time. We sometimes think of the, the bowing and the chanting here as something extraneous to what we're doing in the meditation, but that's not the case at all. It helps us to develop the right attitude. The bowing when we show respect to the Buddha. We're showing respect for the potential of human beings. So it, it's like a mirror that reflects back on us. We, reflect, we respect him because he teaches us to respect the best things in ourselves, our desire for true happiness, respect for our abilities, the good abilities of the mind in terms of your powers of observation, mindfulness, concentration, compassion, goodwill. So it's good to bow down to that reminder every day. And then the chanting, respect for the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and then the various chants we have translations for, to remind us of why we're practicing. I'm going to chant this evening on aging, illness, and death. It develops an attitude of Sangwega, which is Difficult to translate, but it means a combination of dismay over the meaninglessness of life as it's ordinary lived, ordinarily lived, coupled with a sense of awe and urgency. To find a way out. Now the chant doesn't end there, and it also reminds us of the principle of karma, which is to develop another attitude, which is that of confidence. It's through our actions. Nothing else is going to get us out of this dilemma. It's through our actions that we get out. So our actions are important. There's so much in the world that tells us that our actions are not important. Politicians who say they don't care about what people think, they're just going to do what they want to do. Scientists who tell us that nothing we can do to change the general course of nature. Cosmological time, geological time, in which our, our efforts seem to be very puny and ins insignificant. But the p teaching on karma reminds us that that may be the world out there, but the world of your lived experience is shaped by your actions. And this is the world that matters. So because it matters that we want to develop these skills, 
however much time it may take, however much patience it may require. They're skills that are worth mastering. Even if you don't get all the way to the end of the path in this lifetime, whatever progress you do make on the path means just that much less suffering, that much more skill in how you relate to the things that would normally cause you to suffer, or would normally bring about reactions that would make you suffer. So a lot of it is attitude the right attitude that underlies all the other right factors of the path. And when you catch yourself in the midst of the meditation with the wrong kind of attitude, stop. Think for a while about what you're doing, why you're doing it. You can drop your meditation object for that, for that period of time if you want to. You can change it to another topic. There are classical lists of topics for recollection, so when you find that you're frustrated when there's aversion, when there's lust, when there's fear, anxiety. There are specific topics you can think about. You can think about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Think of a sense of confidence. And also to overcome any aversion you may have either to your meditation object or to yourself thinking about the members of the Noble Sangha in the past, past who went through lots of difficulties, years of effort, and couldn't see any headway, yet ultimately were able to gain awakening. They had the patience that was needed to do that. They're human beings, you're a human being. You can develop the patience as well. Once you find that your attitude is more appropriate, then you can get back to the meditation and get back to the breath. So these are, all of these topics are types of meditation. We tend to think of meditation as only one or two vipassana techniques, but that's not true. There are lots of techniques for dealing with all different kinds of the mind. And the teachers will give you just one technique. It's sort of one size fits all. or Henry Ford's old maxim, people can have whatever color of car they want as long as it's black. And given the complexity of the mind, there's no way that one single technique is going to work in all cases. Or that one particular person will have to stick to one technique all the time. You have to realize that there's a whole, a whole toolbox here. Lots of different methods, lots of different approaches. Even within breath meditation, John Lee's Seven Steps. Provide different ways of approaching the mind when it's out of balance. Sometimes we need to focus on the length of the breath, other times when you focus on the, the spread of the breath throughout the body. Other times when you have to be very careful about which point you're focused on in the body. All of these are component factors. And John Fuang once noted that when someone's having trouble in concentration practice or the concentration, the practice is getting out of balance, and it's usually one of these factors is lacking. So it's not that there are steps that you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You find what aspect of the mind is out of balance and you focus on the appropriate step. Until you find that you've got all of them covered. But again, it's a question of trial and error, which requires the patience you mentioned at the beginning. The patience and the equanimity, the willingness to learn, the ability to step back a bit from whatever's going on. When it's not going well, be able to step back and look at it, try to put yourself in good humor. One of the things I noticed about all the really great meditation teachers in Thailand is that they had good senses of humor. They found it easy to direct that humor at themselves. And as someone pointed out, it's the ability to step back from things is what allows a sense of humor to begin with. If you're totally involved, you begin to lose perspective and nothing's funny at all. 
step back a bit, learn to laugh at yourself in a good-humored way, not a sarcastic way, a good-humored way, a sympathetic way, and then get on with the practice. You find then that things go a lot better. So all this comes under the issue of right attitude. It's not listed as one of the factors of the path, but it underlies everything. After all, the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths because he had the right attitude towards suffering. That there must be a way for human beings to overcome suffering, to gain release from suffering. He had the right attitude towards the amount of work it might take to do this, but also the fact that once that, this task was accomplished, it was more than worth the effort. And that once this, once this one problem was dealt with, there meant there really are no other problems in life. They all come down to this one, the unskillful ways we relate to our, the things we identify with as me or mine. And then learning to relate to those things in new ways that are skillful, so that instead of causing suffering, they turn into the path to the end of suffering. So look at this as a friendly path. Think of all the people who've trod the path before, and they're happy to have you join. And they keep pointing to aspects of yourself that you would like to be friendly with, too. You'd like to be on good terms with your breath. You'd like to be on good terms with the qualities of your mind. Well, this is a practice that allows you to develop those friendships. Friendships that will never leave you, that will never turn on you. That kind of friendship takes time, but it's more than worth the effort. To develop that kind of friendship, you have to be giving, too. But what are you asked to give? You're asked to give of your patience, give your respect, give your confidence. Those are good things to give, because you never run out. When you find the, the proper object for your respect, you find that respect becomes a strength. something you can rely on, something you can depend on, all the way to the end of suffering. <laughs>